advertiser, as you probably know. My talk is, uh, are we looking at uh, dot-com bubble deja vu for the resource juniors? When I was here uh, in November, I talked about the low tide in the resource sector and uh, so suggesting that this is the beginning or what comes before a tsunami. And at the time, the Novo story was still running, running very hot and it's cooled off a fair bit since then. But I recently looked at the uh, venture exchange volume and value traded and I said, wow, the tsunami is here, but I'm not feeling it in any of the companies that I follow. For example, my Scandium International, even though they've hit all their milestones in that, was, uh, had trended down and gone flat and uh, was certainly not going anywhere in particular. And uh, the two poster children from last year, Novo, which represents you know, the, the grassroots uh, big discovery story, and Osisco Mining, the uh, big rethink of an existing system uh, spending you know, 800,000 meters, they were all trending down and uh, not going anywhere in particular. So I was starting to wonder, where is this volume trading? Where is this value trading? Now, I have a search engine in my website, and that's what, uh, when you pay the 800 bucks a year, you get to use this. And uh, there's over 2,000 companies, ASX, TSX, TSX Venture in there. You can, there's 5,000 projects. You can search combination of uh, company criteria and project criteria. So it's supposed to be a tool where you can figure stuff out. But the key thing is, I have that data, and, and it prints out wonderful stuff like that. This is my pitch uh, for my uh, non-stock pick service. But I said, okay, I need to find out what the TSX Venture resource companies are doing. And so I put a program together to extract this and separate it from these total volume and value traded uh, figures. And what I got was this chart. And the blue is the value traded by TSX Venture resource listings uh, since 2009, and the green is all the other stuff, which would be oil and gas, uh, uh, whatever, and any of these non-resource things that are on the TSX Venture. And, and the yellow line is the value traded as a percentage of total, total value traded, and the red is the non-resource traded percentage. And by the way, this will be posted on my website uh, by tomorrow, so you don't have to worry about grabbing the pictures uh, uh, off the uh, screen. Um, so you see those two little bubble peaks there, and there was uh, something that went bad in the last quarter of last year. And we know that the uh, big junior resource sector reversal that started at the end of January last year peaked in uh, August. And then we had a pretty miserable rest of the year, uh, even though there was, a, there was Trump won the, uh, the presidential election and people thought this would be good for gold and, and everything. Uh, so I was curious, okay, what caused that spike in that non-resource value traded and what was going on in the last sort of month or so? And so I pulled these from old uh, monthly reviews of the TSXV. And when you look on the lower right and, and the upper right listing by traded values, do you see any resource stocks in there? Well, in the last batch, there's only Garibaldi in there. And in the one from uh, uh, last year in December, I don't think there's any. Well, there's first mining finance in there. So I started looking, what are these companies? And I guess I've been a bit asleep at the switch, living in California, only following the resource sector. I had no idea how crazy the Canadians have gone for weed and blockchain type of stories. All those things in there are the new manias. And as I started to appreciate the scale of what was happening, it was like this deja vu of your experience of 1999 where uh, you know, some subscriber would sent me an email and uh, said, you know, get with the program. Stop talking, talking about these resource dogs. You can easily figure out their upside limit. Uh, that makes them dog. You gotta go into dot-com. Dot-com, sky is the limit. It can keep going and going. It's transformational. And uh, I kind of figured that out and had my own little uh, dot-com junior called Meteor that became ThoughtShare and it did really well. 
until the regulators hooked it for six months. And of course, in the meantime, uh, the dot-com market bubble climaxed in March 2000. And what was followed was by a whole bunch of, uh, you know, several more years of misery for the resource sector. And today we're looking at like equity markets at uh, record, record highs in general. We're looking at these manias uh, developing. Bitcoin itself is like a classic mania because there's no intrinsic value whatsoever. So it could go up another 10 times just because. And it could go back down to zero just because. But there is this frenzy out there now, sort of almost an end times frenzy of getting into these momentum things. Don't miss the boat. Don't follow, don't check into value things that need fundamental things to happen. Just go trade this stuff. So my big question today that I'm going to try and answer, are we facing a similar scenario as 2000 where we're going to see these bubbles climax and we're going to see the overall economy go into the garbage can and the resource juniors are going to have a, another three, four pitiful years before anything happens? So here's an example of uh, why the space is getting so tough for the resource juniors. $130 million raised by this company that's going to sell marijuana. Well, I don't understand this marijuana game. The profitability of it is based on it being illegal. So when you decriminalize it, and it's something you can grow in your backyard or in your room, uh, where is the profit margin going to go to? It's going to vanish. So this is a fantasy in my mind that I do not understand, and it has no transformational implications uh, whatsoever uh, the way the internet did. So I think this is a temporary thing that's going to blow up sometime in the first half and go away. And then the more recent thing that's only about six months old is the whole cryptocurrency uh, mania, and here's this one Hive blockchain. And, and what do they do? They just raised 115 million bucks to buy a bunch of hardware and mine for uh, various uh, cryptocurrencies. And you say, wow, this is the new mining world? Uh, and what is this cryptocurrency stuff all about? And now we're even seeing stuff like we saw in late 2000. So here's some dreary little uh, resource junior you know, trund trundling along at two, three cents uh, with its, you know, unique project that's some, something in Quebec that nobody cares about. And they put out this uh, news release, intention to evaluate new business opportunities and eventually redirect its business to the cryptocurrency and blockchain. It's just an intent. And IROC, which jumps on every resource junior and harasses them if they do not have 43101 boilerplate garbage surrounding every statement, just sits back and does nothing. And look, this thing's gone from two cents to 15 cents. And look at the, uh, the, the, the volume traded, 20, 40, 60 million share days. So now I'm starting to understand why I'm not feeling this tsunami in the space that I follow with the companies, which presumably is what you are here for. So let's look back almost 20 years, 18 years, to the uh, dot-com bubble peak here. And at the time, there was a fair amount of uh, similar stuff, these things uh, that uh, are intending to get into dot-com and planning stuff and spending some money building a website or whatever. And the exchange started shutting that all down in 2000 with their change of business regulations. But of course, it all peaked. And you know, by 2001, it was all all over. Now, gold continued to be dreary until about here, when finally the UK selling ended and gold started going up a bit. But in general, metals were still poor. Everything was still bearish. It didn't change until about July 2003, when finally the China super cycle kicked in and we got a resource sector bull market back. Now, I have this PDAC curse thing here where I've observed that uh, almost every year after the big convention in Toronto, all these stocks that are resource sector, and that used to be that this was primarily, TS Venture was mainly resource stocks, uh, it would all trend down. The green ones are the exceptions. Every once in a while, 
the PDAC curse gets violated, and it was in 2016. 2016 was a great year. Last year, it was back to normal. This year, we have had a relatively feeble um, start to the year. There wasn't the kind of January effect that we had last year. I think this year, the keep PDAC curse will again be violated. Now, why? Well, one of the things about uh, that's interesting right now is this huge controversy between gold and Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, and which is money. Now, the interesting thing is that gold is not money, no matter how much your typical gold bug insists that it is. Money is an information system that keeps track of credits and debits uh, from uh, um, over space and time involving multiple parties involving the exchange of goods and service. It is the basis of a market. It is a price discovery mechanism. Gold is none of those things. An information system is an abstraction that should not cost a lot of money to exist. Now this information system money requires trust and gold has historically played a trust guaranteeing role, and will play that again, unfortunately, sometime in the future. But it is an asset class by itself. Now, the interesting thing happening is that millennials hate gold, know nothing about it, because it tends to be the, the bailiwick of all these uh, elderly, righteous scolds uh, complaining about this and that, and uh, wanting the world changed, and so on, and, and young people really aren't plugged into this thing. So the whole gold sector has been kind of put out of bounds to a younger generation because they just see it as this uh, archaic thing by all these libertarian Ayn Rand right, right winger types. And that's not necessary. Gold is something that should appeal to the entire political spectrum. And the beauty about the cryptocurrency stuff is that it actually is potentially a money system. It will, in future, be the blockchain will be the basis for a global currency, but that could take decades. Right now, it is just a gambling form. It doesn't function as a, uh, as a price discovery mechanism. It's parasitic on the US dollar, and all the revolutionary rhetoric about it, it for the moment is BS. Blockchain itself is also in itself revolutionary. I mean, look at Hernando de Soto's efforts, uh, the Peruvian economist, to use blockchain to become the basis to take all these poor people in places like Peru, where you have informal property rights and therefore no basis for credit extension. They're now talking about creating a blockchain ledger to drag these people out of their ruts they are in so that their lives can grow through a credit-based economy. And Maersk and IBM just announced teaming up for uh, building a blockchain ledger for shipping, which apparently the paperwork sucks up 20% of the costs. So blockchain is real. Where the profits are going to be, I don't know. It's going to be more a profit saving. But what's happening now with the migration of the gold bugs into the crypto world, it's actually liberating gold to become available for hopefully as these millennials who are buying Bitcoin and, and stuff like that, uh, bail out of that, get cashed up, and discover our space. Now, gold's ready for a real price breakout. And again, I always emphasize the, the, the traditional gold bug argument about fiat currency debasement, hyperinflation, uh, yeah, that's true. When it happens, the value of your currency goes, goes way, way down, or at least its number goes way, way up. But gold going to $10,000 uh, an ounce, along with all the costs, doesn't help your deposit. That doesn't quite work at the current price. So what's more important is gold as an insurance policy. And that's the thing, some, some Bitcoin computer network can evaporate and disappear. So that information system is, is blown. Provided that property rights, title to things you own, that's still external or not destroyed in that process, no, no big deal. Gold takes energy and resources to bring into above ground form. 
you can't make it disappear. It's always there. It's an asset class in its own right. And as the world becomes concerned about the possibility that Donald Trump is right, that America is no longer great, and the rest of the world starts exploiting that, uh, you've got to see capital around the world saying, I need to own some gold. And that's called the gold insurance policy premium. This is what can drive gold higher. And we don't need $3,000 gold. We need gold breaking through 1400 and then going to 1600 and then playing in 1600 to 2000 without any serious inflation showing up. And that, I think, is going to happen this, this year. So there's basic groundwork in place for a revival of the junior and even the senior resource sector, at least in the gold space. Now, what about the real world space of commodities? Well, one of the interesting things was that the uh, commodity prices trended up last year, even as it trended uh, as, as the resource equities trended down. And that's been a bit puzzling. But then, you know, I started to understand what was going on. I've been hearing Eurozone's economy is finally taking over, America's economy, the trend that started in 2016, it's still taking over. It's now got the, the, the tax windfall to, to help things out. Emerging markets are doing well. But what about China? Well, apparently they're reporting 6.7% GDP growth, which is, yeah, okay, that's what it's been since the, the meltdown. Uh, well, what's the big deal about that? Except apparently this number is based on real financial data. The reality is that in the last five years, they have hidden how badly the Chinese economy has been doing, which is explains why we have suffered in the resource sector, why the big companies had to shut down stuff, cut backs, and didn't you know, put anything, put, you know, start developing new projects. This gain that we've seen in the metal prices is real because apparently China had a phenomenal year last year. And now we have Trump's big problem is now he's annoyed absolutely everybody. The one thing he can do to bail himself out is to go back to a promise made in 2016 that appealed across the political spectrum, which is infrastructure renewal. And with all this capital coming back to America, I mean, Apple's talking about uh, you know, moving manufacturing. You're thinking, oh, is, are they just kowtowing to uh, Trump's uh, wishes? Well, no, the reality is China is turning into a, a complete totalitarian system. Virtual private networks have now been shut down. Foreign com com companies cannot get anything out anymore, cannot communicate without the state spying. We're already seeing, just as Trump wants to close America off from the rest of the world, China is closing itself off, but reaching out into the rest of the world. So reshoring to America doesn't require any political uh, go, uh, reason behind it. It's just a practical uh, reason, because the reality is America is still great despite what the president says, and it will continue to be great for some time yet. So there is a very good possibility that so long as Trump doesn't start playing with his really big button and cause a uh, nuclear event that's started by the United States, uh, this will be a phenomenal year globally for the economy. And the one sector out there that's been lagging is the resource sector, so there are many reasons for the market <coughs> as it abandons these blockchain and weed manias and all these other things and sort of wonders where the big starts are going to go to move into this space, both for the gold and for the non-gold uh, commodity metals. And then some update on Novo. So all the bloom has sort of gone off this rose. Uh, they told us uh, in December that the fine gold is limited to a little tiny halo around the nuggets, which means it's not going to be helpful to delineate any resource. Uh, they've also pretty much conceded that uh, the nuggets that they're looking at, um, they're not very close to where they came from. They have been alluvially transported. And now the theory is that, uh, yes, these biogenetically created beds did exist upslope, 
but upslope no longer exists. It's all been eroded and put downslope, down, down slope, and now it's been paved over by Mount Row uh, basalt. And so now they're focusing on just like, how do we measure the nuggets and possibly mine it? That's a small scale story. It's small potatoes. They haven't solved that problem yet. They probably will in the next six months. But that doesn't mean very much upside for all these companies based on that alone. But is the WITS 2.0 hypothesis still alive? And I say it is. And what's coming out is that uh, the perception about the Pilbara has always been that the Kailina basalt is the equivalent of the Ventersdorp in South Africa that caps, that's basically the top of the gold-bearing reefs in the sedimentary succession. So all effort has gone into the Hardy formation, which would be the equivalent, and not much has been found. The Australians did a good job. Mark Creasy himself, the Australian legend, looked at all this stuff in Carathon, tried to figure out where these nuggets came from, and couldn't figure it out. And it turns out a fairly narrow horizon underneath the Mount Roe basalt, between the basement unconformity and the Mount Roe cap, that is where WITS 2.0 lies, if it exists at all. And if you wander downslope into here underneath, you may find the lower energy environment, which originally existed in the shallows, where these gold deposits grew with the assistance of the cyanobacteria. So Quinton's story is still alive, but I don't think it will be until the second half that people start drilling way down here and possibly hit WITS 1.0 style mineralization, which you can measure with small core. Right now, we don't know if these conditions existed downslope. But if they did, just as they did upslope, then this game is on again. But for now, we have to sit out and wait for that validation of the WITS 2.0 hypothesis. So uh, I'm almost here ready to wrap up. Why did I invite these particular companies to the Metals Investor Forum? Uh, Azimut Exploration is a prospect generator farm out uh, type of company. <coughs> now I've been negative on this type of company for quite some time because there's been no lifestyle juniors raising any money for resource exploration so you can't farm out to them. And the big guys have been dialing back all their operations and, and not doing any exploration either. But if I'm right about this turnaround in the resource sector, there will be appetite for good projects generated by technically strong teams. Now, Serengeti Resources is a spec value hunter recommendation of mine because it has a copper gold project that's kind of okay at the PEA prices that they did uh, a year ago. But, uh, they, uh, but, but now they've got funding to advance it but it's not just feasibility demonstration. There is expansion potential. So you get both worlds. You get the ride higher on the metal prices, plus you get potential that it's much bigger. And uh, Toachi is one of my newer picks. This one is now a feasibility demonstration story, but it's also a company building story. And in, it's in Ecuador, and Ecuador is set to blossom. It is one of the least explored juicy frontiers in South America, and its time is coming again. And in zinc, this one now is also, you get the zinc exposure, you get the uh, uh, feasibility demonstration. At the current metal prices, this PEA is way in the money. The stock is seriously undervalued, but they just took a big dilution hit, raising three and a half million bucks because they want to test unfinished business that was never followed up from the past that could scale the entire project much, much bigger. So this one's one of these where they need to go in there and actually demonstrate bad news is actually good news because that means they can then turn to the institutions and say, fund feasibility demonstration of what we already have. But of course, we're hoping for the good news version. And then Nevada exploration, I've covered it for a long time. Um, this, they've just put together finally through all this effort a target undercover which if it gets drilled 
it will be proof of concept of an entirely new approach for exploring undercover. And one of my big beefs with the uh, regulatory system with regard to the resource stocks is that uh, they don't let the companies really map out what it would be worth if they succeed, if they deliver what they're trying to accomplish. Their hands are really tied. And I've created a system whereby I can visualize what the outcome is and show people, in this case, if they actually found another loan tree, it would be worth 600 million Canadian. And through my uh, rational speculation model, well, it, the stock doesn't go to that tomorrow, there's stages of uncertainty. So there is actually a pricing model for expiration style juniors. And I think a key thing that I'm working on is to get the millennials to understand that the resource sector actually has a logic to it where you can come in here and gamble intelligently on long-term fundamental outcomes, not just gambling on the short-term momentum volatility of things like blockchain or, or weed, which have no valuation basis for it whatsoever. So I think what's hurting the resource juniors right now, the fact that they do have an upside limit is going to become their virtue in the near term future. And all these companies are ones I talk about, Discovery Watch, once a week I go on, on, on the air with uh, Jim Goddard and talk about companies I think have a discovery or maybe ready to make one. That's just me trying to, without charging, nobody pays for this, uh, to have people be aware of discovery potential. And finally, um, I've uh, sort of restructured my pricing system for now so that nothing expires beyond the end of this year. If you do the uh, 30 day for $100, you get uh, 30 day access to absolutely everything, but you get spec value hunter access, which are these sort of dozen or so formal recommendations until the end of the year. And I will rethink by the end of the year what my new sort of service model will be. Don't know whether it's gonna be cheaper for giant mass markets or more expensive for a much smaller market. Thank you.